Yeah, well, let me see. I just graduated from uh, elementary school, uh, the Smith School, and that's where I met um, Tootie Heath and uh, Ted Kirsten, and actually we met uh, Henry Grimes and uh, Garrison later on, you know, but all these guys were South Philly. We hadn't ventured out at all. We were all in South Philly. We were doing little dances, little places around in the area that we were playing. In fact, one time we would play, there was a funeral parlor that had a little house where they basically, I guess, embalmed the bodies, you know, I found out later on, but we didn't know then. And it was a wood yard, a lumber yard right across the street. On Friday nights, we would go across and get some sawdust out of the wood yard and sprinkle it on the floor in this little, this little um, garage area that they had there. And they would let us play there, play our little jazz tunes, just like I said, uh, the Charlie Parker, the Dizz Gillespie, all those tunes. And um, it would be, like I said, Tootie Heath, uh, Ted Kirsten, Henry Grimes, and also there was um, a gentleman by the name of Kenny Lowe. His father was the secretary of the union, Local 274, and he played the piano. And uh, there was a lot of piano players, a lot of different bass players, but everybody, that's where we basically started. When was the first time you sang in public, before people, it's, it's, you know? In elementary school? Well, if that was the first time. They stood me up on a chair and you know, so that everybody could see me. And that's when I sang. And then I was a part of a, a I can't, it was a Horner Hardage Children's Hour, and I won a contest there. I was about five years old, and then I was singing stuff there for uh, my mother. Said, they said about eight years. I don't know, but um, that was when I started doing public. But but whenever my mother took me anywhere to sing, she would just say, "Please let her open her mouth." <laughs> <laughs> but everybody wanted to take piano. They made me take piano lessons for, I don't know, about six months or so. But uh, I didn't want to go back. They was forcing me to take lessons, and I wanted a bike. I wanted to be riding my bike. And the piano teacher told my mother that he's not interested. Because I would go and just sit at the piano, and she'd tell me to play something, and I'd play one or two notes, and I'd, you know, I didn't want to play it. But I wish I had a, took advice and learned piano. It would have helped me later on. So in turn, I learned chords on guitar. I don't call myself a guitarist, but that's how I learned my changes. By playing enough, you know, to be able to play the chord changes. Okay, you know? uh, so that was part of your early musical training. Did you have any other musical training? I was playing you? drums. When did every, you start? Oh, okay. when I was about six. That's what I had a set of drums home. They was trying to make me learn the piano. I played them all the way up to high school, to Ben Franklin High School. And uh, me and Tootie Heath, Albert Heath, uh, had a rhythm section, but he never he never came to school much because he was going on the road since he was like 14, you know. So I found myself in the section all by myself, you know. Uh, Spanky the breasts on the bass, and uh, and I was in. This guy Ernest Duncan played so much clarinet and alto saxophone. He was the talk of the town back then. That's what kind of got me interested in the alto saxophone. But uh, I didn't start it on until I got about 19 years old, you know. So. So all of them went to Ben Franklin. Did they yes. all go to Ben Franklin? Yes. Jimmy Garrison graduated in 1951. He was bass player with John Coltrane. And by 59, he was with Coltrane, or 60, after Coltrane left Miles. To the end, you know. And uh, there's other ones, Benny Golson. He was there before me, though. He, he started off in Franklin. He graduated in 44. Uh, well, they, they had jazz before any, any jazz band in, in any school in the city, I think, you know, Ben Franklin. They had a 17-piece uh, swing band. They was playing Dizzy Gillespie's arrangements and everything. 
I didn't know of no other, I tried to think back, I don't know no other high school had jazz bands. If they were, back in the 40s when Benny Goldson was going there, I don't know who they were. So I was a pianist um, for the first, I guess I started taking lessons around eight or nine. Uh, that continued until um, I got to the mu music and art high school in uh, Manhattan, um, which is now part of um, Fiorello LaGuardia School of the Arts. And at the time, if you played um, piano and if you sang, you had to take up a secondary instrument. And that's where the bass came in. And that's kind of an interesting story because I got to the sign-up sheet, sign-up area late. And where they had sent me, the choices were either cello or bass. So like I said, I got there late. I look at the list. It's already filled out. And all the girls had picked the cello and all the boys had picked the bass. So I'm like the last one there, and I'm like looking at this list, and I'm saying, and I'm thinking about my hands, because at the time, you know, the bass looks kind of big and like callousy, and I had really, I had no intentions of really playing this instrument seriously. I thought I was going to be a piano player. Um, but I'm looking at this list, uh, it was kind of like, I guess I felt the pressure to, you know, be um, gender pressure. So I ended up signing on to the bass. So that's how I got to the bass. And... I hated it, you know. I don't know if you know, like high school basses, they're not the best basses at all. They're like kind of uh, so plywood. plywood or fiberglass or something. The action's real high. And th we're talking like the early 70s, like 73, 74. So a lot of stuff, it was just like, everything was just really archaic. And my hands hurt and it was, I, mean, I, I literally hated it for about six months. But I knew I was being graded on it, so eventually I, I just said, well, you, you got to figure this out. You got to, and by the time I got to my junior, senior year, I was, I guess I was getting good at it, and I, I like playing in orchestra, so I, I enjoyed that, and I was starting to play piano less and less. Other thing, too, there was a lot, I found that there was a lot of piano players that were just like a lot better than me, <laughs> so, and there weren't a lot of bass players, and I was kind of progressing, so I was like, okay, maybe this might be, you know, for me. As far as formal instruction on the clarinet, the, the school provided lessons, but they were group lessons, uh, so I had to go every, you know, whatever it was, Tuesday or something, after school, for a lesson, but it was a lesson with four or five other kids, and they were all more advanced than I was. So when I went for the lesson, uh, the, the teacher, and his name was Attilio, he, he, he said, like, okay, kid, you play that, and I couldn't play. <laughs> so so he, he, he lost patience with me right away, and at one point he said that his, uh, his expression was, you can't get blood from a stone. So, so he said I wasn't, would never be able to play. So uh, when I went to this football game, uh, at, at Tilio, he remembered me as this, this horrible student that he didn't like, you know. <laughs> and he said to me, uh, hey kid, you still play? And I said, uh, yeah, I still, he says, well, if it'll make you happy. <laughs> Those are the lines I, re I remember, <laughs> word for word. <laughs> I think the first job that I did with a group or a trio was with Dave Posmond here. And we used to do quite a few things together before I met Gerald Price. And he was really my musical mentor when it came to uh, someone in the music helping you. He was my musical mentor to the uh, fact that when I went over his house and he had a dog that stood up like this, you know, a big uh, uh, whatever kind of dog that was. And the dog's name was Lush Life. <laughs> he said because he played playing the piano when he first got him and Lush was in the middle of the room and he hit some key chord on that song, and the dog, hmm, and went and sat under the piano. So he became Lush Life. And he would leave him outside a lot on his patio when, when he was rehearsing or when somebody was there. So one day, I went to his house, and uh, 
Lush was outside, and I said, hey, you know, gave him a pat and went on in. Gerald came downstairs, and he said, how'd you get in here? I said, I walked in the door. He said, and the dog didn't bark or do anything? I said, no. He went out to Lush. She said, that's your job. That is, and especially keep her out of here. <laughs> keep her out of here. Don't you just let her in here. So, I mean, we had a lot of fun together. He was, he was my good buddy. Your memories of some of the major jazz players from Philly, you know, John Coltrane, what, what, what's your memories of him? Oh, John, like I said, he and Jimmy, they were real close because they, well, I remember John when he was playing alto in the Dizzy Gillespie's band. Mm -hmm. Tootie and I used to hook his school to go see, and, and they used to be at the Earl Theater, 11th and Market. It was uh, John, uh, Jimmy on first out of John, um, Paul Gonzalez, Big Nick, and uh, Cecil Payne with the saxophones and, mm -hmm. and the Dizzy's band. And, and um, we, uh, Tootie and I, well, like I said, Tootie and I, we did just about everything we could think of. You know, we'd go to John's house and then with Jimmy, of course. You know, he would take us around to the different rehearsals that the different people would have. And Jimmy Oliver, he and Jimmy Oliver had a little, a battle of sax one time out West Philly. He would take us there, Reds Garlands, and oh, all the musicians, you know, like I said, the Heath Brothers was number one as far as Philadelphia, and everybody loved them, and they loved everybody, and it was just, you know, and I just happened to be there. And how about McCoy? Same thing, basically, McCoy. <laughs> I remember one night um, when we started playing the tune Split Kick, which was, uh, I think, Clifford Brown wrote it. We were at Barber's Hall, and it was Lee Morgan and I, we were on the gig together, and uh, we played the Split Kick. So McCoy was sitting down, like, in front of the bar. So when we came down, he says, um, what was the name of that tune you played? He said, you know, could I get the changes to it? So we told him what the tune was. He said, oh, that's a tune. <laughs> And there would be another you da 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 da. Yeah. And you mentioned Lee Morgan. Uh, yeah, we, well, we used to practice together a lot. You know, I I had a car early in life. I was fortunate to have a car, and I used to drive up from South Philly up to Tioga where he lived at the time. We'd practice in his house and stuff like that. Where the house he grew up in? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah oh. up in Tioga. Okay. What yeah. was he like? Uh, I mean, he was kind of. Cocky, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of people say. A little, a little bit, you know. He, he, and he has, his famous buddy was Kenny Rogers, and they used to play together. Kenny played alto too, right. so they would have a lot of gigs together, and they would have like pillow fights and all kinds of stuff <laughs> like that. So we would talk about what are you guys doing? He said, "You're gonna bust him in the lip, and then you won't be able to make the gig and all that kind of stuff." You know, just different things like that. But. He liked to have fun all the time, you know. He, that, that, that's what he called having fun, you know, just doing all kinds of strange stuff. You know how some people are that way, you know, like to do things differently, you know. Afterward, we went to uh, the showboat, and Sonny Stitt was playing there. And so uh, somebody told Sonny that one of those guys over there is a sax player. And we were sitting at the bar, and... I had my horn, like I'm sitting at the bar, and I had my horn between my legs. So he came over and he said, are you the horn player? And I said, yeah. He said, get your ass up there. <laughs> it's just the way he said it. So if I had any sense, I would have been scared. But I, I said, hey, yeah, I want to go out and play with Sonny Stick. <laughs> and, and later on, I found out, like, you know, he used to kind of destroy some people, like, you know. What'd you play? Well, we went up and he said to me, what, what do you want to play? And uh, the only tune I could think of for some reason or another was Melancholy Baby. And uh, the fact is, like, he and Bird had both, they, they, that was one of the tunes that they played. People always joke about that tune, you know, and people, they make, uh, the, the make fun of it, uh, but uh, he said, uh, I, I made the mistake of saying to Sonny Stitt, I said, the melancholy baby, and, uh, it, but I, instead of saying it that way, I said, do you know melancholy baby? Ooh. And he said, do I know it? He said, I'm Stitt. <laughs> and he said, haven't you heard of me? 
And I say, of course I've heard of you, or something like that. So he turns to the piano player and he says, B flat, you know. And he counts, boom, boom, one, two, two, which was fine with me. I could make that tempo. You know, if he had done, I would have been crawling off the bandstand, you know. But, but I could keep up with it. I didn't sound as good as Sonny Stitt, but I mean, I didn't embarrass myself. So I played a couple of choruses. And then I guess he realized that, that I could play. So, so the audience was kind of egging me on and they're going, yeah, yeah, you know, this, this guy can play, you know. So Sonny made sort of a show of it. Like he, so he would go like, I'd play something and he'd go, you know. And then he, yeah, so, so then he would start trading fours. So he'd go and he'd do, do this. And so, uh, so I would take four and then he, so at one point he, he, he did this, this trick fingering on the saxophone, and it bop, 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 bop. So I did the same thing, and then he would go like this. So it became kind of, and the audience ate it up. You know, they, they loved it. They said, oh, this guy, this kid is, you know, he's messing with Sonny, I guess, you know. The Ortleys had music like um, seven nights a week, first of all, you know, and that, that was like Command Central. That was the place, you know, if you, you know, that was the high point. Um, on the weekends, actually it was like Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, they had, Shirley was there if she wanted to be there. Mickey was there, Arthur Harper, who was like you know, an unsung hero on the bass. You know, had he not had some issues he had, he would have been as well known as a Ron Carter, as a Ray Brown, as a Sam Jones, as a Jimmy Garrison. I mean, he came up in the 50s with all those guys. Um, the Heath Brothers, all those guys, that whole crew. You know, that's when I realized, wow, Philadelphia just really had a rich history. So they would play, and a lot of horn players would come and um, play with them, and they were they were known. I mean, Shirley and Mickey. I mean, they're they're on some legendary records. They they were already established. And like I say, Arthur was right there with them. He just didn't have the notoriety, but he played with some folks too. And he, him and Mickey, they they moved up to New York together. Uh, so guys like uh, Eric Alexander, uh, Joe Magnarelli, some older guys like um, Charles Davis, uh, Cecil Payne. I mean, mind you, we're talking like the uh, maybe late 80s into the you know, early 90s. Tuesday night was the jam session, and prior to us coming in, I think he had Jim Holton um, on piano, Bill Zeno on bass, and Billy James on drums. And Billy James had played with um, guys like Sonny Stitt and Don Patterson, the organist, who actually was a big influence on Joey DeFrancesco. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, Joey talks about Jimmy Smith for obvious reasons, but Don Patterson was right there. Because if you hear some of Don, you, you hear a lot. I think more, he was probably influenced more from Don Patterson, you know, but certainly those guys. And, Billy was his drummer. He was one of the first drummers I played with when I remember doing gigs. I remember playing with him, he, him being really just a sweetheart. So anyway, um, Pete, wanted, Pete Souders, who owned the place, was a saxophonist. He wanted to make a change, so he brought in um, myself, because at the time I was starting to sit in and play a little bit and play, start playing some upright. So I guess I don't, I don't want to, um, I want to say like maybe like 95, 94, 95 in there. So he brought in um, myself, um, Sid Simmons, who I had heard um, playing in TNTs, and Byron Landham, who I played with when he was 16 years old at a place called La, Cha La Champagne, La Champagne, I think, which is right across the street from um, the Borgia. I'm getting the years mixed up, you know. But Sid I had heard, and actually Sid had gotten me um, playing with Don, late violinist John Blake Jr.'s group, because he was playing with that band. So he'd heard me, and that was mostly an electric fusion kind of thing. So we became a unit, like the mid '90s, and we'd play every Tuesday. And you know, Pete would play, and then people would come in, like younger people, you know, maybe some older people. And that's where maybe that kind of on the bandstand me mentoring kind of came about. You know, when I saw that people really enjoyed what I did, and and I was enjoying it, because when you're enjoying it, it's not like it's work. Yeah, you 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 enjoy it and you like going there and I you know that's when I decided that I wanted to just do that. Just the way it makes me feel. I like to tell the story. And 
I like the, when people listen and say, oh, wow, yeah, you know. I, I like that. I, I enjoy that. It's not about being a star. It's about enjoying what you do. And I enjoy that. I was doing Kate May Jazz Festival. And I was, I was singing. The people would not leave to go to hear any of the other performers that were working at other venues for the festival. So people couldn't get in. New people couldn't get in. And then when, uh, what's her name, Woody's wife came. Oh, Carol. Carol said, oh, you have to stop. We have to stop at a certain time. He said, well, well, well why we have to? Well, that's, it's because it's the rules here in Cape May. They will fine us. So this man said, well, I'll go around with a hat, and we will collect the fee to pay for her to stay up there. Best advice I was ever given, I don't know what you call it advice, but uh, well, little Jimmy Oliver. He told me, man, this business is rough. But if you keep blowing long and hard enough, somebody going to hear you. That's it.